recording and yeah it's time to start yeah yeah all right today we're going to be discussing the facility security plan this is the foundation of every security department out there okay this is where you come up Hey, Tim, Mike just called. Needs to make the time card. Eh? Okay. Hey. There are 10 things you need to be aware of for a facility security plan. It must cover identification procedures, access control, your internal security, your perimeter security. What? Security lighting. Oh. Is there a fist fight going on out there? Okay. It also is where you define your security alarms, video surveillance, and what type of communications you're going to have for your facility. It outlines the training and uh, security force awareness. Okay. All right. Push the button. Um, security plan format, how you're going to format your security plan and your response procedures, how you're going to conduct your annual reviews, and how you're going to conduct your physical security surveys. Let's jump right into number one on the hit parade, identification procedures. Now, we're going to talk about employees, visitors, contractors, uh, vendors. Let's talk about employees first. You, each employee should have an employee or slash union photo ID. It, uh, tells you who they are, it's got some kind of identification uh, information on it, preferably with a, a color photograph. It must be presented upon request. We require that you wear it above the waistline and fully exposed while you're in the facility. You know, usually on a lanyard or on a lapel clip or on a pocket clip somewhere. Um, should be color coded. By color coded I mean uh, the color uh, defines where they're allowed to go. You might have red for restricted access. They can go into uh, uh, secure areas, uh, green for general access, and blue for visitor access, whatever you want to do. Hold on a second. Let me put you on mute. Mute, mute. Sorry about that. Fearless leader. Okay, uh, where was I? Color coded background checks. Before you issue um, uh, an employee or union ID card, you need to have done your background checks. We talked about that in investigations. They should be cleared to work, and they should be told where they're allowed to go with their ID cards. Should be uh, renewed on an annual basis. For contractors, they generally issue for the term of the contract. For visitors, it's for a term, meaning they're only allowed to be uh, in the building for a uh, specific day and time. Uh, for contract, uh, for regular employees, uh, you should have anywhere from one to three years. They should have to get new ID cards. Okay, they should be laminated to keep from being uh, tampered with. Should be serialized. Okay. And you must maintain a log of which ID cards are issued, especially for visitor IDs. A lot of people will issue a visitor ID and forget to get it back. So whenever you sign one out, make sure you get it back. Okay. All right. Where are we at? Uh, identification procedures. Vendors, contractors, vessel pilots, if you happen to have waterfront facilities. Okay. Before you issue them a visitor's uh, pass, they must show a valid photo ID, must be some way of verifying that they belong there, okay? You should have an access list for your vendors, your contractors, and stuff like that. There it is right there, access list. 
truck drivers and passengers, they should also have a valid photo ID, government ID, not just one that's made up at home, and have a verification process. Now, I don't know if you all have been following the, the new uh, way of stealing from uh, out in California, but they are setting up false, uh, uh, what do they call them? freight forwarding uh, offices, and they are sending uh, trucks out to collect nuts. And by nuts, I mean like cashews, uh, pecans, uh, whatever else, almonds. These thefts, a truckload of these can fetch anywhere from four, uh, forty dollars to $200,000 a truckload, depending on the nut. Okay, and what they're doing is they're forwarding fake uh, freight bills out to uh, the uh, – the farms and this guy shows up and loads up the truck and it never goes to where they they say they're going they're selling it on the black market so with truck drivers you um, and passengers you must uh, ask for a valid photo ID have the freight forwarder send you a, their a copy of their ID straight to you so that you can verify the truck driver that shows up is the same truck driver that uh, is supposed to be picking it up Okay. Ta -da. Visitors and other categories. Okay. Um, they should also have a valid photo ID, uh, driver's license, passport. Uh, they must have a reason for being there, verifying they're visiting somebody and who's going to escort them. And it has to be scheduled in advance. In advance. <coughs> uh, Hang on a second. I just got popular. Okay. Um, yeah, uh, visitors should be scheduled in advance. They should be on an access log for a visitor's access log. Who, and that log should say who they are and who they're visiting and what time they're showing up and the expected uh, duration of their visit. For government employees, valid government ID should be given access to complete official visits, inspections. Now, in some facilities, even if you're working for the same agency, you may have to escort them if they're from another part, depending on the security clearance and the security levels they're going to be visiting. So that must be in the log as well. Uh, moving on, access control. Armed guards, local police department response. Okay, when we set up our access control, we want to define where people are going to be coming into our facility, where they're driving on, where they're walking in, where they can go, and how they and the procedures for getting them checked into the facility. We just talked about IDs, okay? And whenever they're coming, we want to define um, who's meeting them or if they have full access, whatever. It has to be written down in your plan. This person has full access because he's this. This person has to have escort because she's this. So whenever you're doing your plan, you have to lay out all, the, all these different things for access control. Who's got access? Is there an access control list? What does it look like? What's the information we require for it? All this other stuff. Also, you want to talk about your gates, your access gates. Are they locked, secured, guarded? Are they open 24 hours a day? Are we going to have some kind of uh, 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 bollard system or, or vehicle uh, uh, barrier system installed at the gates? When, when are they going to be deployed? How will they be deployed? Things of this nature. That's all part of your facility security plan. <clears throat> Whenever you're expecting deliveries, they must be scheduled in advance, and you have to post it that they are subject to search. You can't just arbitrarily say, okay, you're delivering uh, office products. I want to search your vehicle. Unless you, they know your security plan outlines that all vehicles are subject to search, and you post it. It has to be posted. Okay, so that everybody is informed, do the search. 
Internal security, vehicle control. We want designated parking for visitors, um, and we also want to set up our restricted area in the buildings or even on the facility. You don't, and it doesn't have to be for uh, security reasons. You can have restricted areas because it is a noise hazard, it is a, a injury hazard, whatever. You can restrict access to your plant floors. We don't want somebody walking into the uh, the cabling room where all the power comes into the plant unless they have a right to be there and know the dangers inherent with that. So you can post it as a restricted area. Whenever you're setting up your uh, gate pass system, you can use a decal system, uh, color coding, um, paper passes, whatever you need to do that uh, designates not only the vehicle has access, but where they are allowed to park, um, if it's restricted parking area, it should be a different color. Whenever you have temporary passes uh, for visitors and vendors, you make sure that it has an expiration time on it. It's just a paper pass. You write the time they arrived, the time they're, and when the pass expires, okay, so they can't be reused, okay. Rail security. If you have rail gates, let's say you have a train uh, line that runs through your facility, you need to work closely with the the, the railroad to, to understand the schedule so you can open and close the gates so you can close your perimeter. A lot of facilities have uh, uh, train delivery yards on the facility, so this has to be worked out. Usually they're not main lines, they're, they're shunt lines, so you're expecting them in advance. Whenever they're not there or you don't need them open, you lock the gates. Internal security. First thing you want to talk about is how you gain access, physically access. Are you going to use key, uh, a cat card, a pin card, uh, what, whatever. That's You need to write that down in your plan and how it's going to be managed. There's a lot of systems out there now that uh, use uh, uh, swipe cards, and you can actually put uh, the photo. You can turn that into your uh, employee ID card. It has the photo, the identifying information serialized, and it actually controls where they go in the building. And it also acts as your master ledger. Who has the cards? What card is assigned to this person? And it's serialized. Failing having an automated system, you're going to have to issue the card manually. Uh, you need to keep a master ledger of who got what card, what the serial number is, and how long it's good for. The other part of internal security is inspection of locks, locking devices, and key control systems. We're going to get into key control a little bit more heavy next week. Um, it's not just having a ledger and issuing a key to somebody. It's a whole lot more than that, but we'll get into that later. You also, part of that is uh, your case hardened locks and chains as part of your key control system, how they're issued, they're serialized, you need to keep an eye on them. And computer security. This is usually handled by the IT department, but it, you work in conjunction with the uh, IT department because passwords are just like a master key. You get somebody's password, you have access to everything they they have access to. Can anybody say Snowden? I thought you could. <coughs> also, let's talk about guard force rounds. Uh, roving safety and security patrols. Okay, these are conducted uh, by your either contract guard force or your or proprietary guard force, and you have to set what has to be checked. Okay, you want them shaking doors. Do you want them checking windows? Do you want them looking for uh, fire hazards or safety hazards? This is all part of your facility security plan, what their duties are, okay? They're supposed to conduct rounds. I hate this part. Conduct rounds at least once in a four-hour period at varying times. Okay, let's get serious about this. They should be conducting continuous rounds. They should alternate their rounds, and at a minimum, minimum hit everything on their patrol route once in every four hours. More frequently, the more varied, the better, okay? 
If you leave it at check everything once every four hours, they will do it in about 20 minutes and then sit on their butts. Okay, it has to be in their post orders that they can do continuous rounds and everything has to be checked once in every four hour period or more frequently. Okay, you also must have a method of recording the rounds. A lot of people use uh, Ditec. It's just a little wand. It has a little sensor at all the high security places they have to check. They just touch the wand to it, take it back to a computer at the end of their rounds. It downloads what time they were there and, and stuff like that. Kind of like the old time clock where you had to pull the key out, put it in, turn it, and it recorded it, and then you took it back. But it's a little bit more technically enhanced these days. But you should, if they're checking, doing their rounds, there should be a record, a hard record of the rounds and what they checked when they checked it. Perimeter security, um, whenever you set up your perimeter security, you have to post it and, how to say this without offending anyone, Yep, sorry, I can't figure out how to not defend people. Okay, you have to keep the bad guys out, okay? Uh, you have to tell them that, uh, what the penalties are if they violate your restricted areas. They'll be detained, turned over law, law enforcement, what laws are applicable. Also, your perimeter security allows you to channel um, access to your facility. They, it says main gate this way, whatever. Whenever you're uh, doing your facility Plan, that's where you set up and say this is the type of barriers I want this is how far I want the perimeter cleared of vegetation and debris uh, and you also identify the contractors that are going to be out there or your own people who's responsible facilities is responsible for keeping the grass cut and you want to identify supporting safeguards for natural barriers okay just because you have a river that's part of your uh, perimeter security does not mean that river is going to keep people out. So you need to have a roving patrol. This is your supporting safeguard for that river. Or if you have a mountain, you've got a uh, CCTV cameras watching the face of that mountain to make sure nobody's repelling down into your facility. So you need to uh, not only use your natural barriers, but what supporting uh, safeguards you have to back those up. Ah, uh, fencing. We've talked about this. It's going to be eight feet high. Usually the fence is seven foot high with a one foot top guard. The fence should be nine gauge galvanized steel. Two inches wide chain link is the recommended with a two foot uh, with a barbed wire outrigger consisting of three strands of nine gauge wire at a 45 degree outward angle or inward angle depending on which way you want to stop the flow of traffic or both. The bottom of the fence has um, got a wire running through it, also 9 gauge, that's 2 inches above the ground that keeps people from pulling the chain link out and creating an entryway under the fence. It should be very tight. You want to make sure the fence line is clear of all obstructions. You don't want to have a multi-million dollar fence line around your facility and then have your guys stack crates up against the fence line providing access to your facility. You want to keep that clear. Whenever you're doing that, you want to sit there and say, you cannot stack any material within 20 feet of the fence line. The parking lot can't be within uh, 10 feet of the fence line, so they can't pull their vehicles up and use their vehicles to hop over the fence line. I've seen that. Uh, you want to make sure you keep it clear, make sure nothing's growing on it, uh, so that you have a clear field of view, whatever. Perimeter security. Lighting. Whenever you're setting up your security lighting, it should be set up along your perimeter or wherever you need it. You know, it should be, let's talk about the perimeter first, then we'll talk about the buildings. Uh, should be sh shown outward from the perimeter. The lighting should be inside your perimeter. You don't want to have your light pole sitting outside where they can just sit there and whack off the, the power cable to it should be illuminated at least to the level of twilight. That's just that's the level of light just after the sun sets. 
we'll get into uh, security lighting a little bit more on Wednesday. But uh, it's measured in lumens or foot candles. Okay. You want to use uh, updated lighting technology such as high pressure sodium or mercury vapor, uh, metal halide, whatever meets your needs. Okay. It's directed downward away from guards. Why do we want it away from guards? Okay. We don't want to backlight our guard force. We don't want them to be a target. Okay, it should be away from guards, offices, it should be away from navigable waterways, and it should produce high contrast with very, very few shadows. It should be overlapping, okay, so that you can watch any approach to your perimeter. Okay, this is where we get to design our, our, our integrated security system. We're going to talk about what kind of alarms we're going to put on the fence. We're going to talk about the kind of sensors around the building. We're going to talk about our video cameras. Where we're going to do uh, infrared. We're going to do color. This is your wish list come true. We're going to design our intrusion detection systems. We're going to have our control and switching systems in restricted access areas. And we're going to set it up so that our response time working with our guard force is no more than five minutes. Okay? That's pretty good. I don't have a problem with the five-minute response plan. Security alarms, video surveillance, communication system, CCTV, placed at main entrance, exits, and in high-risk, high-value cargo areas. If you have a shipping facility, you want to put cameras inside and outside. You want to watch the approach to the shipping facility, and you want to keep an eye on the cargo that's sitting in there. Okay? This uh, should be a point. This should be recorded for up to 96 hours. You should have a capacity to record all CCTV inputs for 96 hours. That means it records and it holds before it uh, records over. <coughs> Okay, uh, camera should point uh, to entering and leaving vehicles. Uh, watch your pedestrian access points while they're entering and exit, uh, exiting the facility. This is good legal record. Okay, one note on CCTV. Uh, there's been some le um, legal actions taken on. Um, Whenever you're using CCTV, uh, the one thing you have to be aware of, if there are cameras out there, then there's an expectation of security. If you put fake cameras out there that don't record, they don't see anything, they don't broadcast anything, you're liable if somebody gets mugged, murdered, uh, robbed, whatever. They have an expectation of security because they thought those cameras were recording and reporting what's going on. Don't put up fake cameras. There's a hospital system that lost $20 million because they did that in litigation. All right. Security alarms and video surveillance communications continued. Communication tested once per shift, and you have to record the results. Make sure you have comms with all your security officers to the uh, emergency managers, whoever's on shift. They should have emergency signals, duress signals. Um, if one of your security officers wanders into something and he needs to be able to pop the cord or push a button or whatever that, that, that broadcast, he's in trouble. Um, they should have adequate backup emergency power, um, meaning that if you're using handheld radios, the batteries must have a, a operating life 20% higher than the shift they're going to be working on. Okay. Uh, if you're using a base station, you should have dedicated emergency security uh, backup power. You have to conduct training on using communications, okay? You can't just use it like a cell phone. You should have your, your broadcast codes that are uh, like 10-4, 10-6, I'm on break, whatever. You should have training on that and how the equipment actually works and what is the capability of the equipment. I would encourage encrypted communications, by the way. Training and security awareness. Training and qualification program for your security force. What 
you have to meet state requirements if you're using proprietary or contract security. Okay, doesn't matter. Every state has their own requirements for it. That's the minimum. Um, the other things you want to to train on are their law enforcement and security guidelines. Uh, you want to talk about uh, company policies and security plan. They need to be briefed on your security plan, and they need to be briefed on the response procedures. If they have an alarm over at the cargo handling facility, they need to know how to respond to it, what their duties are whenever they get there, and how uh, they handle anything that they find. Okay? Their primary job is prevention, detection, investigation of criminal activities. They are there to observe and report. Most security guards do not have arrest authority other than uh, citizen's arrest. Okay? Um, moving on. You also must have specifically the job specific training requirements you want for them. If they're going to be moving stuff around or they need to move stuff around, you've got to have a weight, uh, a minimum weight they can carry. Uh, they must be able to meet the uh, physical requirements of the job. You know, if they're going to be walking a post, you know, walking perimeter or doing uh, interior uh, patrols, they need to be able to walk for a specified period of time. Then you must train them on. Then you must train them on reporting threats, actual criminal and terrorist activity. How are they going to report it? Who are they going to report it to? And what their job is in relation to the activity at that time. Observe and report, mostly. You also need to have uh, training on communications and surveillance systems. If you're going to have uh, everybody trained on your control center, they need to know how to operate the cameras. They need to know how to uh, handle alarms as they come in, how to silence the alarm, what to do when the alarm goes off, all this stuff. Ronnie, would you mute, please? Hello? Okay. Notification procedures when higher security levels are imposed, okay? Uh, you may move your security level from, like, level 1 to level 2, depending on your threat. You need to know, they need to be trained on, if we're normally in level 1 security posture, you know, that's a normal day of operations, but we've received a threat that somebody's going to hijack one of our trucks. We need to know what procedures are in place. These are written procedures that uh, you're moving your security force from level 1 to level 2, and what their jobs are now if they are different from what you do in level 1. Okay? Okay. Click on that. Uh, security plan format and response procedures. Facility plan. Everything we've talked about above has to be in your facility security plan, and it's got to be detailed. It also um, must designate by name the facility security officer. Now, facility security officer for us in the government is the guy that handles our clearances. In the civilian world, he is actually the chief of police for that facility. Don't confuse the two, okay? Here we get kind of details, security plan format and response procedures. Response procedure, unauthorized personnel discovered on the facility. What is our response to that? Uh, we're going to detain them, not arrest them, escort them to security, and depending on what they were doing when we found them, we may or may not turn them over to the local police to handle. Uh, we will advise them that they are no longer allowed on the facility, issue them a letter of uh, uh, debarment so they can't come back on so that the next time they come on they are in violation of the debarment and we can charge them, have them charged with criminal trespass. Unauthorized to illegally park abandoned vehicles. This is probably the facility officer's biggest headache because in most civilian facilities the security officer issues the parking tickets. He's responsible for all the parking. He assigns the parking. And he has to have a policy in place for whenever people are, there's an unauthorized vehicle, illegally parked vehicle, abandoned vehicle, tow it. Just tow it. Okay? 
Also, if you're working along uh, where you get your deliveries from uh, up here that's adjacent to your property, you need to know what to do about unauthorized vessels mooring along. You work with the Coast Guard on that. Response procedures, too. Okay, let's talk about bomb threats. We've covered bomb threats pretty pretty thoroughly, uh, but you got to write down your response your your procedures for it. Who is actually going to be uh, doing the evacuation escorts? Who's going to be in charge of the uh, the search? Uh, each post has to have their specific jobs in a bomb threat identified, listed, and written down in post orders. Okay. And we talked about suspicious person and activity response. How they're going to respond to those? What happens if we lose power and lighting? Okay, we're going to issue them flashlights or everybody's going out on the perimeter, whatever. If you happen to have a mail handling room and security's there and we got a suspicious package, what are the responses to that? Okay. Everything has to be written down. This is part of your security plan. Okay. You should do an annual review of your security plan, period. Look at it, make sure it's up to date. If you've had uh, employee changes, have they met their training requirements? Right after that, you need to do your physical security survey. As soon as you review the plan, do the survey and see if they still match up from the last year's survey. Have you improved conditions or have they gone in the toilet, depending on your budget? You're going to talk about a little bit about risk management here. Risk management should be taken into account. When we're talking about risk management, risk equals vulnerability times threat times consequence. Okay. To give you an example of this, we have a power transformer sitting just inside our perimeter. It supplies all the power for our facility. It's inside our perimeter, but the only thing, it's only 20 feet inside our perimeter. The only thing between it and really bad guys is a chain link fence. That chain link fence does not block the bad guy's view of it. So how vulnerable is it? We assign a numerical score to its vulnerability. Next thing we do is we look at the threat. Who is, has, one, who wants to do something to that transformer? Two, do they have capability to do that? And three, have they done it in the past? And four, are they around our current geographical location? Okay. And then we take the vulnerability times the threat. Let's say our vulnerability is 100 and our threat is 0.25. Ta-da, that gives us a 0.25 vulnerability assessment. Now, we need to multiply that by the consequence. If we lost that, okay, if we lost that transformer, would it shut us down? Well, we have a second transformer that takes that has half of it. So our consequence would be 50% 50, 50 reduction, or 0.5. So we take that 0.2, uh, that, uh, that 25, multiply it by 0.5, and we got a risk score of about, 20, let's say. That's our risk score for that transformer, okay? Um, risk, analytical risk management is really a great science. I recommend you all take a course in it, but this will just give you an idea of how risk management works. You need to identify the vulnerability, what's vulnerable, what's the real threat to it, and what will happen if something happens to that uh, asset. We like to talk about assets as PIFAO. It's people, information, equipment, facilities, activities, and operations. PIFAO. Let's talk about security levels real quick. Level one is the degree of security precautions to take when the threat of an unlawful act against a vessel or terminal is thought possible but not likely. This is what most organizations operate at on a daily basis. This is sure it could happen, but it's not very likely. Okay. 
Level two, security level, the degree of security precautions taken when the threat of an unlawful, it's basically the same. But you have intelligence that indicates that terrorists are likely to be active within your area or they like attacking this type of vessel or this type of facility or terminal, okay? So, yeah, you have an asset that they, they really like going after, but you have to look. Are they really operating in my area? Or are they really doing this? So, yeah, I'm a little uncomfortable. We're going to increase our security level. Now, remember, whenever we bump our security levels, we're going to have different procedures for our security force, and we're going to have, through training our staff, they're going to have different uh, things they're going to have to do. Level three, high uh, level of intelligence, it's probably in, intimate, or in, it's going to happen soon, and intelligence indicates that, tell, uh, that the terrorists have chosen a specific target, and it's us. We're going to go on high alert here, or we're going to be working in pairs, our security force is going to be working in pairs. Um, we're going to uh, double up our staff at the control center, we're going to bring everything out all the guns to bear to protect our assets. Any questions on security levels? Now in the government we have different, we call them different things, but for civilians, level one, level two, level three. Okay. Okay, I got some pretty pictures here of a chain link fence. It does not have an outrigger top guard, it just has a straight up and down post on it with three strands. Okay. I just find pretty pictures everywhere. Now, I want you all to take a look at this picture. It's not the fence so much I want you to look at, but what is the problem with this uh, picture right here as far as security professionals go? Look in the background. You've got a fence blocking your view. It's within a... a a hundred meters of your perimeter. You got trees growing in your boundary area out there. It's blocking your view. Anybody can use that as cover to, to get up to your tree. Very good. That was Ronnie. Yeah. It was Roy. Yeah, excellent. What's wrong with this picture? Top guards damaged. Somebody's uh, beat this up, and we've got this bush growing right up against our fence line, giving people access to our facility. Wow. Does anybody see the fence in there? I didn't either, but there's a fence in there. It's a barbed wire fence. This is a, an example of a sign that uh, where you post your perimeter that we talked about just a little while ago. It lays out what the penalties are. It says what will happen. And I didn't get all of it, but down there, all vehicles are subject to search. Ta-da. Oh, there it is. See, subject to fortune. Yeah. Okay. That is just a picture of a uh, badly installed CCTV camera post. The problem with this is if you all will look, you'll see all the cabling with the cameras run outside the post. They're not in any kind of conduit to protect them not only from the elements but from tampering. Okay? Ta-da! Okay, physical security surveys. We're on the downhill side here, folks. Uh, it's, it's a record or documentation of, of the physical security status of your facility. It tracks previous uh, security surveys. It tracks the recommendations you made on the previous security surveys, and it allows you to, 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 uh, to verify the milestones for improving our, your security recommendations, track the milestones on those to see where you're at. It also identifies security breakdowns, where you have faults. It may be old faults that uh, were identified before that haven't been addressed, or it could be new faults found on this survey. It also allows you to uh, evaluate your current security systems. Are they adequate to the threat risk? Remember, you're going to be doing your threat assessments and your risk assessments all through the year. If the threat increases, does your current security uh, status uh, meet the threat? 
Okay. It also helps you identify short-term and long-term goals for security upgrades. Get your paperwork in early because whenever remember when we're doing the budget, we got to ask early and we got to ask for as much as we can get to get our security equipment in. And it also allows you to uh, report on your unit's mission. Uh, you need to increase your guard force because the threat level has now gone from or from level one to level two, and we're constantly in level two now, so we need to add more people. Whatever it, it helps you report your your assessment or your your needs. Okay. Let's take a look at our security plan one more time. It identifies procedures for access control, internal and perimeter security. It uh, talks about lighting. It uh, has a security alarms, video surveillance, and communications, how we want those to go down. And it identifies the security force training and the, the employee security awareness training. Don't forget that. Any questions on what we've covered today? No. Excellent. Y'all have a marvelous weekend then. Roger, you too. I'll think about it anyway. Ooh, don't freeze. <laughs> I won't.